They were haughty, it says. They, they were proud of their abominations. The word proud or pride is worth looking at. Why? If there was ever a word in the Bible that I did not want to associate with my life or my ministry, it would be pride. Out of all the words, why would the word pride be attached to a community? The entire month of June is called Pride Month. And it's catered to the celebration or the flaunting of sexuality. I don't ever think it's wise to flaunt my sexuality to God. Me, I'm talking about Matthew Mayer. There's no scripture references where I should ever lead with my sexuality being my identity. That's not right in any direction. There are people that have been deceived. There are people that have been confused. There are people have, who have been told this is the way to live. There are people who have been manipulated. There are people who think they've been born with that desire. And the church should be a safe haven. And I know that's hard to balance. I'm struggling with it even tonight. You could probably hear it in the way I'm communicating, trying to call it what God calls it while at the same time saying, all of us are in desperate need of redemption to come back to God's divine design, all of us. But at the same time, I can't be naive to choose a word that God says, pride comes before a fall, and then to choose a symbol that in Genesis, God gave humanity as a means to never destroy the world again by water, the rainbow. Every time you see a rainbow, the Bible says, it should bring you into remembrance of my mercy. And out of all the symbols in the world, a rainbow? What is that saying? So my goal this morning is to tell you what the Bible has to say about the rainbow and, of course, pride. As already prefaced, it was not my plan or intention to go in this direction, but the Lord interrupted that trajectory and has laid on my heart the passages of Scripture and the overarching theme of this message. My audience is the church of Jesus Christ. And what you need to know, and I should probably say this every time I preach and teach, my audience primarily, like Paul's epistles to the early church, is the believer. How I communicate from here to the bride of Christ and the church is likely not going to be the same way I communicate to a non-believer out there. Do you understand that? Every one of Paul's epistles was written to do several things simultaneously. Admonish the church and course correct her. Rebuke her when necessary. Edify the church and build her up, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That is my task. The overarching theme of the entire message can be summarized in this one statement. And you got to get this. If you don't get this, you don't understand anything that follows. Whatever the Lord has established or, or ordained, the enemy, the devil, he seeks to sabotage. He seeks to counterfeit. He works to sow weeds amongst the wheat. And that was a parable Jesus told. Anything that is good in God's sight, the enemy seeks to sow tares or weeds. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between a wheat and a weed. Whatever the Lord has created, the enemy seeks to counterfeit. Whether it's a soul, whether it's a system, whether it's a society, be it a person, a policy, a principle, if God ordained it, the enemy wants to undo it. That's it. And everything that is about to follow finds its grounding in that statement. So where do we look? To the book we look? Where the origin of order begins? The name of the entire book tells you the purpose of the book? Genesis, beginnings, origins... Genesis 1 and 2, in fact, lays out the groundwork for all of humanity. Did you know that? Genesis 1 to 11 is actually the framework of all humanity. And then there's a break at chapter 11 with the birth of a nation through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But between chapters 1 and chapter 11, you get the origin of order and disorder, right? Summarize it again, Matt. Bible or Babel? Truth 
or lies, good or evil, light or darkness, Christ or the spirit of the Antichrist. Those are the categories. Genesis 1 and 2 lays out the creative order, or as said last Sunday, natural law. Natural law was the law that God judged the people in the days of Noah. Natural law was the law embedded in the conscience of man that he would know what was right and what was wrong. Before Mosaic law, before the law of Moses, there was natural law, or we say it, the laws of nature and nature's God. Genesis 1, we were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, in the image of God. There are, of course, characterological implications of being created in the image of God. There are spiritual implications, ethical implications, emotional implications, moral implications, and of course, physical implications. Therefore, as created in the image of God, ladies and gentlemen, as the church of Jesus Christ, you are a mirror of your creator. When you look in a mirror, it's a reflection of your image. When God looks at his creation, he sees a reflection of his image. Out of the mirror of God comes moral order. From the mirror comes moral. There you go. There's your alliteration. From the mirror comes moral order. That's laid out for us in Genesis 1 and 2, when God gave explicit instructions about their responsibility in the garden. Out of moral order, guess what you'll find next? In Genesis chapter 2, the order of marriage. Mirror, moral, marriage. Of course, marriage is the first union between a man and a woman. That's the order of marriage. That's the only order of marriage as the Bible prescribes. That is what I call the divine design. That is God's best. He lays it out in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Of course, out of a marriage comes a family. When Adam knew Eve, they had offspring. That became one of the institutions, one of the bedrocks of society, if you will. It was God's idea to ordain, you ready? Mankind in his image as a mirror the order of morals as a reflection of his image, and then marriage. Did you know the Bible begins with a marriage? In Revelation, it ends with a marriage. And smack dab in the middle in Malachi, there's a marriage. Did you know Jesus is called our groom? The church is called his bride. Did you know Paul teased out and taught about the reflection of a man and a woman in the confines of marriage is actually a reflection of Jesus's great sacrificial love that he has for his church and he laid down his life for her. Now we know all that. What's the point? The point is, if we are created to, to mirror the image of God, why are we surprised that the enemy seeks to distort that mirror? You ever been to the funny house? You look in those mirrors and they're distorted. They don't give you a proper reflection of who you are. And that's what the enemy does. He distorts the mirror of God in man. If he can distort the mirror of God in man, he can, of course, contort the morals of God in man. Distortion of mirrors, contortion of morals, and of course, if he can get those two, he can sow lies and weeds to abort marriages. If he can get the world to not see marriage as God has intended it, and we abort marriages, and I use that word in the general sense of its meaning. It's why the family and the marriage between a man and a woman is under attack. And yet here's the sad reality, church. To even touch on and talk about these things in the world we live in, in the culture, we'll have you labeled a bigot or a hater or a sexist or a racist, and the list goes on. So what do we do? We don't touch it. It's like not my life's goal to wake up and be like, you know what, today I want to be called a bigot. But the truth of God heavily outweighs the opinions of man on my life. So the serpent then, he comes in in chapter 3, and here we are again. And the very lie that he sowed to Eve, it was this, it was simple. Did God really say that? And she says, yeah, he did really say that. And then he says, did he really mean that? There it is. 
Did God say? Yes, he did. But did he really mean? And therein lies the lie. She takes of the tree, going against moral order, natural law, and she thrusts her and her husband, Adam, into a fractured creation. The serpent accomplished what he wanted. The serpent wants to usurp the divine design of natural law for unnatural lust. There it is. What is he trying to do? Usurp the divine design of natural law or divine design of the mirror of God and man and replace it with unnatural lusts. Unnatural lusts. And how does he do it? Did you know there's a love that is sinful? Right, so love is not love because love needs to be defined. The saying love is love is a circular argument. You cannot use love is love as an argument against what I'm, what I'm teaching. You need to define what is love. If love is love, then what is love? Well, the Bible tells us what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, the definition of love, the gospels, the demonstration of love in Jesus. But more than that, God is love, okay? Which means, in the language, God is love, it's God's love. And God is the only one that can define Love. So what do I mean by saying love can be hateful? Do not love the world. Wait, what? Yeah, do not love. That is a unnatural lust. The world. What is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And here's where it gets really interesting. Because the serpent tells Eve it's not what God meant. In fact, when you take a bite, you're going to be like God. You'll know good and evil. You know what it says next in Genesis 3, 6? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, pride of life, do not love the world, for all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of God. She took, she ate, she gave to Adam and he ate. The rest is biblical history. Genesis 4, the first murder. Cain kills his brother. Cain kills an image bearer of God. And then you get a genealogy, Genesis chapter 5. And then the world is populated. And it doesn't take long to be introduced to Genesis chapter 6. And the condition of man, summarized in Genesis 6 verses 5 to 8, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. Here's like a a glimpse of God's heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8, don't miss it. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's the gospel. It's right there. Sinful man rebelling against God, rebelling against their creator, and yet God still extends a grace of sorts or a mercy of sorts. But the translation in the original language of the Hebrew says, the imaginations of man's mind was evil continually. And we know that the imaginations of man's mind is evil continually today because the imaginations of man's mind, the images of man's mind is often projected so that we can see it on the TVs and the movies and the medias. You want to see how broken the imagination of man's mind is scroll through social media all that is is a projection of the evil thoughts of man's mind see when the image of god is marred in man the imagination of man is far from god oh and the further man's mind gets from the thoughts of god says we get creative with our evil. In the Psalms, chapter 10, verse 4, the wicked in his proud countenance, the wicked in his pride, does not seek God. Pride does not allow a man or a woman to seek God. Ready? God is in none of his thoughts. God cannot be in the thoughts of a prideful man or a prideful woman. I doubt I have to provide any color commentary about the perverted imaginations of man. But I will, to answer the question, how far have we fallen? How far 
have we fallen into the pit of darkness. Recently, the L.A. Dodgers announced in honor of Pride Month they were going to be hosting an organization called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are a group of trans men and drags who go out into the community and put on drag shows as part of their service. The L.A. Dodgers, of course, organization and, and her fans, there was an uproar saying, we do not want to have this type of organization represented. So the L.A. Dodgers uninvited the sisters of perpetual indulgence. That, of course, woke up the woke mob. And, of course, they pushed back as the pet pressure groups that they are. They intimidated this is what's crazy about this. The moment you touch on things like this, people attempt to intimidate you so that you shut your mouth. And I want to be abundantly clear. As long as God has me here, no woke mob or pressure group will be able to shut me up from speaking the truth. Fun fact, the L.A. Dodgers were named after their fans who, on their way to the ballpark, were dodging the trolley cars, and they became known as Dodgers. Interesting, right? The L.A. Dodgers were unable to dodge this trolley, however, that was coming their way. They extended another invitation. They caved to the pressure and they invited to give a Community Hero Award to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And you're saying, what's so harmful about that? I don't know. Let's see what this explainer video has to say about it. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are a nonprofit organization dedicated to communities that are not taken care of by the government. I'm Sister Till the Next Time, and I am the current abbess of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence in San Francisco. We are a group of queer nuns that serve our community just like nuns do. We raise money for people who are in need. We are always at bars and just being present for people on the street. A lot of people just need to have a talk with us. We are not tied to any religion, but we are not mocking anyone. We are not mocking anyone. But since 1979, we provide support. People have been suffering from guilt that they've been carrying. And we are just here to free the world from all the guilt, to spread universal joy. We are your favorite nuns, and we are here to show people that we love them. All right, so obviously a nun is a title for a woman or a sister in the ministry primarily with the Roman Catholic Church, clearly mocking that. And that performance of dancing provocatively around the cross of Jesus Christ is something they do commonly in the community. And that is why allowing that to occur in America's favorite sport is a mockery against the image of God. How does humanity get to this point? Well, like the days of Noah, that's what Jesus said. It's flagrant pride. Pride, therefore, needs to be defined. What is it? It's an attitude of rebellion against God. Pride is not a quality ever worth flaunting. The Bible says that pride makes us self-focused. Pride makes us self-promoting. Pride makes us self-indulging. Pride is the root of rebellion. And like Lucifer, we seek to take God's rightful place by determining, here it is, our own truth, our own way. I'll define my own life. Proverbs 16, 18 says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And the culture and the climate of the days of Noah was one of pride. And pride manifested in various directions with wickedness and lawlessness and perversion. And this was the day of Noah as pride in the face of God is what caused him to be sorry that he had made man and moved in his sorrow, he had to act. Why? Because he's a just God. He's a righteous God. And what we see today is a culture of pride. An entire month labeled pride. You know, that's not what it's about. 
Now then, what is it about? Right, because last week we celebrated one day for those that gave their lives for the freedoms that we hold. And yet for the next month, you're going to see flags being flown. And this is not to cause anyone to be angry or hostile. That is not the posture of the church. But you need to have a biblical worldview. When you see it, something should happen inside of your heart and mind, right? And I'm going to get to that. Pride, however, blinds. I know this from firsthand experience. Pride in my life, like the disease that it is, caused me to think more highly of myself than I ought. I was blind by pride. And that's what the Bible actually says occurs. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said, ready? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If there was an opposite underneath of that, it probably would say, cursed are the proud in heart, for they will not see God. And I could say that because biblically in James chapter four, verse six, God says it like this. I resist the proud and I give grace or myself unto the humble. Pride blinds. Pride binds. Pride leads to bondage. Pride binds us to shame. Pride bonds us to sin. Pride binds us to self. And of course, the chief attribute of Satan, pride binds us to him. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Pride blinds, church. Pride binds, church. Pride blends. What does pride blend? Pride blends truth with lies. Pride will blend light with darkness. The prince of the darkness will lead with something that sounds virtuous. Like love is love. Or some choice organizations that use the name, which is something we would all agree with, like planned parenthood. Of course, I want to plan my parenthood. But a more appropriate name when you understand the intention of the organization should be aborted parenthood. See, pride blends. The Equality Act, if passed, will be to the destruction of this nation. You heard it first from here. Well, shouldn't we be about equality? No, not allowing a biological man to walk into the restrooms when there's biological females and women in there. Not allow a biological man pretending to be a girl playing in women's sports. Do you understand what's at stake? Image bearers of God as pride is blending and blurring. The Respect for Marriage Act, which President Joe Biden codified, which led to the lighting up of the White House for the second time, once in 2015, next, seven years later, God's number, in 2022, the color of a rainbow. When you look into the bill, it has nothing to do with respecting marriage. You cannot redefine what God has defined. Pride brands. Pride brands. It blinds, it binds, it blends, it brands. What do I mean by brands? Psalm 73, 6. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. The proud in heart wear it proudly, like a brand or an icon or a banner or a flag. Right? There, there's this absurd movement where we want to be identified by our appropriate pronouns. Because I'm going to brand my pride, and if you don't tell me that I'm he, him, and then you fly off the handle if I don't identify you as she, her, or maybe if I'm that daring, they, them. And I'm not poking fun. I'm simply telling you there is an enemy, and he is blinding the eyes of many, and he is confusing our children, and there are adults who are complicit, who are participating in this madness. And God is giving us over to this very judgment. And we are branding our pride and we are haughty in God's eyes. You see, those who depart from the image of God will follow a God created in their own image. That's how that works. Right? So this was the makeup of the world in the days of Noah. This is what the world will be like right before Jesus returns. Jesus said it. He said in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, as the days of Noah so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Question, what was it like during the days of Noah? 
Answer, Jesus says they were marrying and being given to marriage. They were buying, they were selling, they were living their life. What's so bad about that? He's cluing us in. He's saying the culture, the culture lived as if things were normal when everything around them was immoral. And, and let me say it like this. They made what was immoral normal. So life carried on just as it is happening today. Jesus primed his disciples by bringing them into the condition of planet Earth right before he would return. In between the days of Noah and the days likened unto the days of Noah, guess where we're at? We are in the days where a rainbow is God's symbol and covenant that he has extended mercy to anyone from anywhere who has done anything. And right after he flooded the world and restarted with a man named Noah and his family, this was the sign of his covenant. Here we go. Genesis 9, verses 12 and 13. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for, here we go, ready? Perpetual generations. Guess who inherited this covenant? This is not just the Noahic covenant, as we call it. You have inherited this covenant. You are part of the perpetual nature of this covenant. What's the covenant? Verse 13, ready? I set my rainbow in the cloud. Notice God takes claim of what's about to follow. My rainbow, he says, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and earth. Here's God's covenant with humanity. And he puts a beautiful rainbow, as we know it, in the sky. After a heavy rain, a storm, you've seen the rainbows. My question to the church is, when you see that rainbow, does it bring you into remembrance of Genesis 9? Think about this, because I'm guilty as charged. I've seen plenty of rainbows, and I don't even think about God. And yet that is him flashing his brand in the sky, his icon, if you will, his banner, his covenant, his sign, his witness, his flag, his flag. It's a flag flown for forgiveness to anyone who sees it should not be a flag flown for flagrance. Isn't that the interesting dichotomy here? Of everything that God put in the sky as an act of mercy, not to be a free-for-all for all people. It was him saying, here I am, honor me. And we take what God has ordained and the devil seeks to sabotage and we fly it right back in his face. And listen to me, I know there are people part of this community. I know there are people in this church. Everybody has a friend or a family member part of this community. I do too. That does not prevent me from prescribing to what God has to say about it, though. See, the rainbow in Scripture is a banner of God's mercy. The rainbow in culture is a banner of man's depravity. Whether you want to believe it or not, that is actually what is happening God's rainbow has seven colors, as Sir Isaac Newton discovered. Seven colors, perfect to the seven notes in the musical scale. Seven being God's number, make no mistake. And out of all the numbers, why does the pride flag have six colors? I'll tell you, because six is the number of man's fallenness. Six is the number of man's brokenness. Right in the amount of colors in the rainbows, we are told a story. The rainbow is God's symbol, and that is why the devil has hijacked it to mock God. People who are in the midst of it might not even realize it. That's the point. There is a blindness. I know God is the only one who can open eyes and change hearts. I know that. But I also know truth must prevail shared in love so that God can work through his word. See, the way, the way the culture is using the rainbow is actually antithetical to the God of the Bible, and believers ought not be afraid to reclaim the rainbow. Did you know the next time the rainbow is mentioned in the scriptures, it's Ezekiel chapter 1? And in Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel is called unto God. He sees a vision, 
in a trance, he sees this. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the cloud on a rainy day, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, it's almost similar language to Genesis 9. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. What was it? This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Wait, the glory of the Lord around his throne in heaven is a rainbow? Is that, is that what you're telling me? No, that's what the word is telling us. And you know what the prophet's response in light of seeing the rainbow around the throne of God? When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. He hears Jesus speak to him. This is what's happening in Ezekiel 1. You know what happens after Ezekiel 1? He falls on his face. Chapter 2 begins, and God calls Ezekiel and sends him. And he goes, hey, go tell this stiff-necked and rebellious people, thus says the Lord. In other words, you communicate what I tell you to communicate. And by the way, whether they receive you or refuse you, they will know a prophet has been in the midst of them. You know what happens next? He's told to eat the scroll. He eats the word. Before he eats it, he sees it as a scroll with seals. He defines that scroll. He says it looked like a scroll of woes and lamentations and mournings. And he eats it. And I believe it's God allowing him to feel what he felt. Go out there and tell my creation who's supposed to be a mirror of my image, but they've skewed my morals. They've aborted my marriage. Go tell them to repent and return. And he sees the rainbow and he's humbled by the sight of the rainbow. See, the rainbow in scripture inspires humility. The rainbow in culture incites pride. You know what happens next? The apostle John, in a very similar vision given to him by Jesus, in Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, He's called up into the heavens. He sees the throne room, likely the same throne room Ezekiel saw. You know what he sees next? And there was a rainbow around the throne. You know what happens next? 24 elders drop to their knees in worship to the glory of God. The angels sing in one accord, worthy is this God. In, in Revelation chapter 5, he begins to see something unfold. One that looks like a lamb who was slain. He discovers it's the lion who's gonna come reign. He takes a scroll that has seals on it and no one was worthy to open the scroll but this one. And then you know what follows in Revelation 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and all the way to chapter 19 before the marriage of the lamb are the woes being unfolded upon planet earth. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Church, in other words, on the other side of a rainbow is not gold. On the other side of a rainbow is God. Do you understand that? See, the archetype, the archetype of that rainbow in heaven at the throne room is the rainbow that you actually see on earth in the sky. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Genesis 9, 14 to 16, it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will, and I will look on it. God is looking at his rainbow. Why? To remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. So when we see that rainbow, God sees that rainbow. Now think about how the rainbow is being expressed from our perspective and how God sees the rainbow in the sky. And when he looks through that rainbow and he sees the misusage of our rainbow, what do you think he's feeling? I'll tell you. As expressed through Peter, God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Ready for this? But that all would be led to repentance. Now watch this. 2 Peter chapter 3, that was verses 9 and 10. That entire chapter, if you were to read it on your own, guess what it's connected to? 
Because I asked the question as a student of the Bible. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Capital H, his promise. What promise? What is being referenced here? You do a little backtracking and you'll bump into the answer. That's how amazing God's word is. 2 Peter chapter 3, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Be reminded that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, Old Testament, and of the commandments of us, New Testament, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first. You ready? What comes first? Scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts unnatural lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation you Christians and your God is returning when's that happening you've been saying that for ages Peter verse 5 for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Well, guess where Peter just swung us back into? Genesis 9. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. There is his promise. What promise? That he's coming again. What promise? That his rainbow, as long as you see the rainbow in the sky, there's still time to return to the Son of God and turn from the God of sin. And that is why when you put all this together from Genesis 9 to Revelation 4 to Ezekiel 1, you realize how important the rainbow in the sky is and the colors thereof. See, the rainbow of God may be mocked now, but the God of the rainbow will not be mocked in the end. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, that's how urgent this message is for the church. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the, the sign. This is the, what's the sign? The rainbow. Did you know the word bow in Hebrew in the actual text? Genesis 9, not a play on words. Genesis 9, when he said, I will set my bow, my rainbow in the sky. It's the same word that is applied to an archer's bow, a warrior's bow, a bow an arrow. Did you know that when an archer or a warrior came in from battle and war was over, he would take his bow and he would hang it on the wall as a posture of peace. His time of war was over. And he would be reminded when he saw his bow on the wall hanging like a rainbow that he was in the season of peace. You know, the next time a flood of God's wrath came to planet Earth. And you're going, wait, no, it said that he would never do that again. No, you missed it. The next time a flood of wrath came to planet Earth, there was also an ark. And that ark was a person. And his name was Jesus. And we call him the Prince of Peace because he would be the one that would broker peace with a God who was at war with sinful humanity. And yet he looked out on his creation and like the culmination of evil in Noah's day, it reached the heavens. And instead of God flooding planet Earth, he sent us his only begotten son who stood in the gap in the way of God's flood of wrath. And the Bible, according to John, says he became the propitiation, which means he not only appeased the wrath of God, he, you know what the next word is? He absorbed the wrath of God. And the only way to have salvation is to step into the ark of Jesus Christ. The only way to have peace when you see that rainbow and you're reminded that God hung his bow in the sky and we're in a time of peace through Jesus Christ and those outside of that peace are still at war against God. It's amazing to me how God lines things up. You see, last week, 
busy week moving into Memorial Day weekend, I had somebody reach out to me and they wanted to meet. Somebody from my distant past, right, knew of them. They felt compelled to tell me their testimony, compelled. We eventually linked up. They came here to the church. I sat upstairs in the office with this individual who for years identified with the LGBT community, blinded by the lifestyle. And they sat across my desk and shared with me how the Lord has reached them where they were and opened their eyes and set them completely, entirely free. And they said to me, when I was in it, I couldn't see it. And you know what struck me was the long suffering of our God and the patience that he has with us. And I guess what I'm trying to say is God is going to save who he wills. And there are people who are being delivered. And that is why there is always a rainbow of redemption after a flood of ruin. And that's not just for the topic at hand. That is for all of our lives. You better believe no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what sin you're struggling with right now, no matter your deep, your dark secrets, there is a rainbow of redemption waiting for you. And God is able to deliver you from that flood of ruin. I know this firsthand as well. Now, here we go. Church called Landmark, coming over a bridge from the mainland. Whether you know this or not, perhaps it'll bring every Landmark goer into remembrance of how faithful our God is and how time is short. Because when you drive over that bridge, did you know you're driving over pieces of land that are called Rainbow Islands, Rainbow Channel, Look it up on a map. I said, Lord, I'm about to speak this morning about a rainbow. I need to see something. And I've never seen this before coming over. Either I'm not observing. And sure enough, the water was so low that you could see all of the land, the rainbow islands, as we go over the bridge. Not sure if you also know this fact. In 1879, this entire island was founded by four Methodist ministers, Christian men, they declared that Ocean City would be a seaside Christian resort, a camp meeting place for ministers who are looking for a retreat, a time away from the hustle and bustle of ministry. And they would meet and pray under a cedar tree. And that cedar tree could have been seen at the Ocean City Tabernacle since its inception. In fact, they were responsible for building the Ocean City Tabernacle. And people from all over would come to this island. And in the words of Reverend Burrell, one of those four ministers, he wrote in 1881, we consecrate another portion of this coast to the service of God and for the best interests of humanity, where a Christian family may pleasantly and profitably spend the heated term. That's what he said. Sits its foundation. That's why it's a dry island, right? Back to the original theme. Whatever the Lord establishes, the devil seeks to sabotage. Because next Saturday, for the first time in the history of Ocean City, they will be welcoming a pride fest. And they will be meeting on the grounds of Ocean City High School. And they will be going on a pride march. And they will be expressing what they believe is their truth and how love is love, as it says on the flyer. Now, what should that cause you to do? Here's what it should cause you to do. It should cause the true believer to pray harder than ever before. It, it should cause the true believer to love longer than you've ever loved before without compromising truth. It should cause the true believer to be brought into remembrance of a God who saved us from ourselves and our sin, and he's able to save anyone from anywhere who's done anything. And when you see a rainbow, and you might see some next weekend being flown around, don't let it promote hostility in you. Let it provoke a prayer life in you and bring you into remembrance that forgiveness of sin is readily available in the sun. And when you see a rainbow on social media, would you be brought into remembrance that God is merciful and that 
that you have been forgiven. And as Paul wrote to the church at the time, there was all types of sin dynamics. And he says, God has delivered some of you, like such were some of you. And you know you lived that lifestyle too. And you were far from God and God found a way to reach you where you were at. So let us be a church that is well-pleasing to our God who does several things simultaneously. Let us rightly handle the word of truth. Let us be reflections of the one, the person who called himself the truth. Let us be the church, the pillar and the ground of truth. And let us yield our lives over to the one who was identified as the spirit of truth. Let us reclaim the rainbow in Jesus' name. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. I appreciate that. You're going to have to stand to sing the final song, so you might as well stand in one accord. And if you didn't stand, I just took a quick snapshot of every single person. Because don't stand for me. I will let you down. We stand for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, this is your house. These are your people. I pray your words flowed through me. If there was anything I said that was not part of your will, I pray you just erase it. Remove it from our minds. Convict me of where I've fallen short as we move forward as a body of believers. Let us do so in the spirit of love and truth. In Jesus' name, amen.